would say to me, get up there and make it happen. And I would, I had to do it because he told me to. We love you so much, so very much. I can only tell you what's happened with me and what's happened to my life. And in the 15 years of my career, I got a chance to- There are voices that define a generation. Diana Ross is one such voice. Sequined gowns, electrifying performances, and a voice that soars with power and soul. We into one. This is about someone who was more than a musical icon. It's about Diana, the girl from Detroit with a dream, the businesswoman who defied expectations, and the mother who nurtured a legacy. Get ready to explore the incredible journey of this musical icon, from her Motown beginnings to her reign as a global superstar. This is the story of Diana Ross and how she lives now that she's 80. Early life and family. Diana Ross, the iconic American songstress and actress, was born on March 26, 1944, in Detroit, Michigan, setting the stage for a life that would become nothing short of remarkable. The second of six children born to Ernestine and Fred Ross Sr., Diana's arrival was marked by a strange mistake. Maybe it was destiny, maybe it was fate, but instead of the originally intended name, Diane, her birth certificate had Diana written on it, Yet her family and Detroit friends simply called her Diane her entire life, a name that held more meaning than the one on paper. Diana's childhood was filled with the love and support of her big, happy family. There were her parents, of course, and her brothers and sisters, Wilbert, Fred Jr., Arthur, Barbara, and Rita. They all lived together in a lively neighborhood near Highland Park, Michigan, and guess who lived right next door? None other than the future Motown legend, Smokey Robinson. Life, however, wasn't always a song. When Diana was just seven, a harsh reality struck. Her mother fell gravely ill with tuberculosis. Faced with this challenge, Diana's parents made a heartbreaking but necessary decision. To ensure their children's well-being and their mother's proper recovery, Diana and her brothers were sent to live with their maternal grandparents, Reverend William Moton and Mrs. William Moton. This decision led to a temporary move for the family to Besser, Alabama, where Reverend Moten served as the pastor of the Besser Baptist Church. Thankfully, Diana's mom pulled through. Plus, the time she spent with her grandparents turned Diana into a real trooper. So back to Detroit they all went, the whole family reunited. And that's where it gets interesting. It was in this buzzing city that Diana Ross, against all odds, would find her calling. She'd become a star, an entertainer who would leave a huge footprint on the music world. You know, the kind of singer everyone remembers, from Promets to Supremes. So, Diana was back in Detroit, ready to take on the world. Music was her calling. By the time she was 15, in 1958, she was already dazzling everyone as part of a girl group called the Promets. They were awesome, these girls, but they weren't alone. There was a guy group called The Primes, and these two groups kind of worked together, like a super team. It was all thanks to their manager, a guy named Milton Jenkins, who had a good eye for talent. Speaking of talent, that's where Diana came in. A member of The Primes named Paul Williams heard her sing and knew she was something special. So he told everyone about her amazing voice. The Primettes, with Diana alongside Betty McGlown, Florence Ballard, and Mary Wilson, even won a big talent show in Windsor, Canada in 1960. Their win caught the attention of a very prominent figure at Motown Records, a man named Robert Bateman. He heard them perform and knew they were something special. Diana, by the way, was already famous for her incredible live shows. She'd blow everyone away at these dance parties called sock hops. With Motown in her sights, Diana knew she needed some help. So who did she turn to? none other than her old neighbor, and maybe even a little something-something back then. Smokey Robinson, he was already a star at Motown, so Diana figured he'd know the ropes. Smokey surprised Diana with some advice. He told her the Primettes should actually audition for another label first, before even thinking about Motown. It seemed crazy, but they made a deal. The Primettes would do this other audition, but their awesome guitarist, Marv Tarplin, could join Smokey's group, The Miracles, for a tour they had coming up. Diana thought it was a fair trade. Marv would get some experience on the road, and the Primettes could see what another label was like. Finally, the big day arrived. The Primettes got their shot at Motown. 
They sang their hearts out for the bigwigs at the label, and guess who was blown away? The founder himself, Barry Gordy. Diana especially stole the show with her incredible voice, particularly when she sang a song called There Goes My Baby. It was magical. Believe it or not, even though Barry Gordy was super impressed with Diana's voice, he actually told them to finish high school first. Priorities, you know? That didn't stop the primettes, though. They were hooked on Motown, so they started hanging around their headquarters, which they called Hitsville, USA. They weren't stars yet, but they helped out by clapping and singing backup on other Motown songs. Diana even became the unofficial everything girl for the group, sewing their clothes, doing their makeup and hair, the whole works. In late 1960, they got a new member, Barbara Martin, replacing Betty McGlown. Finally, they got their chance to record at Hitsville's studio. Their neighbor Smokey Robinson, who was kind of a big deal at Motown by then, even wrote some of their early songs, like Breathtaking Guy and Your Heart Belongs to Me. These songs were popular around Detroit, but they didn't quite make them national stars yet. Still, it was a big step for Diana on her road to music stardom. The Supremes era. So, in a major turn of events, Barry Gordy finally gave the green light to sign the girls in January of 1961. There was one catch though, they needed a new name. This is where things got interesting. One of the singers, Florence Ballard, had a stroke of genius when it came to picking their new identity. She suggested the Supremes, which stood out because it didn't have the usual atets on the end for a girl group. This was a brilliant move by Florence, showing a real understanding of how to create a unique name that would connect with audiences. Diana Ross, always the one to think ahead, had some reservations though. She wasn't sure if the Supremes sounded a little too masculine, you know, like a boy band. But even with these doubts, the excitement of joining Motown and the power of Florence's idea ultimately won out. On January 15, 1961, it became official. Barry Gordy signed the contract, officially welcoming the group into the legendary Motown family under their new name, the Supremes. This was a turning point, a moment that set the stage for an incredible journey that would see Diana Ross and the Supremes become superstars. The group wasn't done evolving though. In 1962, Barbara Martin left the band, and by 1963, the Supremes had officially become a trio. This is where Diana really started to shine. With her incredible voice, she naturally stepped into the lead singer role, adding a whole new level of awesomeness to the group. This shift was a turning point, laying the groundwork for what would become an unmatched string of hits. Their big break came in 1964 with the release of Where Did Our Love Go? This song wasn't just any song, it became their first number one hit and the spark that ignited an era of incredible success. The Supremes were changing the game, not just in music, but in personal life and even marriage scandals. It was a wild time. Speaking of change, 1965 was a big year for Diana personally too. She finally made it official and changed her name from Diane, as she was originally called, to the iconic Diana we all know today. This was also the year she started dating Motown's CEO, Barry Gordy, which became a pretty fascinating chapter in her life story. Now, Diana and Barry were a hot item for a few years. They were quite the power couple in the music industry. You know, a boss and his star singer. Things got even more interesting in August of 1971 when Diana had her first child, Rhonda Suzanne Silberstein. Diana's then-husband, the music legend Robert Ellis Silberstein, raised Rhonda as his own. It was a unique situation to say the least. Diana actually waited until Rhonda was 13 to tell her the whole story, that Barry Gordy was her biological dad. Before that, Rhonda just knew Barry as Uncle BB. Being married to Robert Ellis Silberstein brought Diana even more joy, the joy of motherhood. They had two daughters together. Chudney Lane Silberstein joined the family in 1975, and then came Tracy Joy Silberstein in 1972, who you might know better today as the talented actress Tracy Ellis Ross. Unfortunately, things didn't work out between Diana and Robert, and they divorced in 1977. Breaking Barriers Diana Ross wasn't just a singing sensation, she was a history maker. In April 1974, she became the first African-American woman to co-host the Academy Awards, proving her talent went far beyond the stage. 
The following year, she kept the momentum going with her fourth solo number one hit, Love Hangover. This dynamic track was a perfect example of Diana's versatility. It started out as a smooth, seductive ballad and then exploded into an energetic disco anthem. In 1976, Diana launched her wildly popular An Evening with Diana Ross tour, which took the world by storm. It even included a two-week residency at the legendary Palace Theater on Broadway. But that wasn't all. Diana also filmed a television special based on the tour that got nominated for an Emmy. This special was truly something special. Diana transformed into iconic figures like Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters, and Josephine Baker. It showcased her incredible range as a performer and even earned her a special Tony Award for outstanding performance. 1980 was a landmark year for Diana musically. Her album Diana dropped, featuring hits like I'm Coming Out and Upside Down that topped the charts. This wasn't just another album, it was a whole new level of success for Diana. It resonated with a younger audience who loved to dance, proving once again that Diana's music was truly timeless. The hits kept coming in 1981 when she teamed up with Lionel Richie for the beautiful duet ballad Endless Love. This collaboration was another major achievement, landing Diana her sixth and final number one song on the Billboard Hot 100. That's right, six number ones. But Diana's life wasn't all about music. In 1985, she met a Norwegian shipping magnate named Arne Ness Jr., and they got married in 1986. This marriage expanded her family in a whole new way. Diana became a stepmother to Ness's three older children, and they also welcomed two sons together, Ross Arne and Evan Olav. It wasn't always easy. There were some challenges, like when Ness had an affair, but they stayed together until 2000. Family is incredibly important to Diana, and she's so grateful for her big, loving clan. It got even bigger in 2009, when her daughter Rhonda gave birth to a son named Rafe Hawk. Becoming a grandma added even more excitement to Diana's already extraordinary life. Personal struggles, roots, and aspirations. Things changed a bit for Diana's family in 1958 when she was just 14. They moved to a new neighborhood in Detroit called Brewster Douglas, housing developments on St. Antoine Street. It was a working class area, a different scene from where they lived before. But Diana, ever the trooper, took it in stride. She actually thrived in this new chapter. School was a big focus for Diana at this time. She went to Cass Technical High School, which was a really prestigious magnet school downtown. It was basically a high school and college rolled into one, and Diana had big dreams for her future. Diana's big dreams at Cass Tech weren't about music. She actually wanted to be a fashion designer. She dove headfirst into all the classes that would help her achieve that, mastering everything from sewing patterns to making hats. Who knew hats were a thing back then? But learning wasn't enough for Diana. She was a go-getter. So, on weekends and evenings, she took extra classes in modeling and even cosmetology. It turns out Smokey Robinson, who was already a star at Motown by then, was a real friend and helped her out by paying for some of these classes. That's what friends are for, right? Diana wasn't just about books, though. She was full of energy and joined the swim team and did a bunch of other activities at school. You could tell she was destined for something big. In 1960, Diana took her first real job as a bus girl at Hudson's, a fancy department store downtown. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but guess what? Diana was the first African-American bus girl they ever hired. Pretty groundbreaking, right? And Diana wasn't one to just sit around. She had to hustle. To make some extra cash, she even offered hairdressing services to her neighbors. Finally, in January 1962, Diana graduated from Cass Tech, officially done with school. But little did she know, this was just the beginning of an amazing career in entertainment. Transition to a solo career. In May 1970, Diana finally took the leap and went solo. She released her very first album on her own, and it was a huge success. This marked the beginning of an incredible solo career for Diana. Her solo power kept growing in 1971 with the release of I'm Still Waiting. This song wasn't just another hit. It became her first number one record in the UK. That's right, Diana was taking the world by storm. The hits kept coming that year. Diana also had her own solo television special called Diana, and it was a showstopper. 
She even teamed up with the Jackson 5 for a performance. Can you imagine? Talk about iconic. But Diana wasn't just about music. In 1972, she decided to try her hand at acting in a movie called Lady Sings the Blues. This wasn't just any movie, it was a biography of the legendary jazz and blues singer Billie Holiday. A lot of people didn't think Diana could pull it off, but she proved them wrong. Her performance was incredible, and even famous jazz critics like Leonard Feather were blown away. Diana could sing and act, what a talent. Diana's acting debut wasn't just a movie, it was a smash hit. Lady Sings the Blues was a biography about the legendary jazz singer Billie Holiday, and Diana's performance was amazing. People doubted her at first, but she shut them right up. Her acting was so good, she even got nominated for an Academy Award and a Golden Globe. The movie's soundtrack was a hit too, selling millions of copies and topping the charts. Diana really could do it all. In November of 1972, Diana even showed off her versatility by lending her voice to a children's album called Free To Be You And Me. She sang a song called When We Grow Up. How sweet is that? 1973 was another big year for Diana musically. She scored her second number one hit in the US with the soulful ballad, Touch Me In The Morning. Diana also teamed up with another Motown legend, Marvin Gaye, for a duet album called Diana and Marvin. This album was a hit internationally, and Diana even made history on her tour for it. She became the first performer ever invited to meet the wife of the Emperor of Japan at the Imperial Palace. That's pretty impressive. Later Career Achievements In 1980, after over two decades with Motown Records, Diana Ross decided to explore new ventures in the music industry. Motown offered her a severance package, but RCA Records came in swinging with a groundbreaking offer, a massive $20 million seven-year recording contract. This record-breaking deal offered Diana complete creative control over her albums, a significant power move for a female artist at the time. Diana approached Barry Gordy, the head of Motown, to see if he could match the offer. But unfortunately, it wasn't feasible for Motown. On May 20, 1981, Diana Ross signed the highest-valued recording contract in music history at that time with RCA Records. Her debut album under RCA, Why Do Fools Fall In Love, was released in October 1981 and sold over a million copies, solidifying her commercial success as a solo artist. This marked a new chapter in Diana Ross's phenomenal career, one where she wielded greater creative control and continued to break barriers in the music industry. Her first album with RCA, Why Do Fools Fall In Love, wasn't just a hit, it was a million seller. It included catchy tunes like Mirror Mirror and her soulful take on the classic Why Do Fools Fall In Love. Diana wasn't just about music though, joining RCA gave her the freedom to explore other ventures. She started her own production company called Anide Productions and even dabbled in real estate. But music remained her passion and she continued to tour extensively around the world. Her success was undeniable, and in 1982, Diana Ross received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, a true mark of achievement. The hits kept coming with her next album, Silk Electric. This one featured a song called Muscles, written and produced by none other than Michael Jackson. Muscles became a major hit, earning Diana a Grammy nomination and landing in the top 10. The whole album went gold, which is a pretty big deal in the music industry. In 1984, Diana released Swept Away, featuring a beautiful duet with Julio Iglesias called All of You. Another standout track was Missing You, a heartfelt tribute to the legendary Marvin Gaye that became a global smash. Swept Away also went gold, solidifying Diana's commercial success. Diana continued to push boundaries with her 1985 album, Eaten Alive. The lead single, Chain Reaction, produced by BG's mastermind Barry Gibb, topped the charts in the UK and other countries. The title track, a collaboration between Michael Jackson and Barry Gibb, was another hit. Diana Ross, the queen of reinvention, was always keeping things fresh. The music videos for Chain Reaction and the title track really helped them become hits. Diana also lent her voice to the iconic charity single We Are The World by USA for Africa in 1985, which sold over 20 million copies worldwide. What a powerful song for a great cause. 
Diana's star power continued to shine in 1986 and 1987 when she hosted the American Music Awards two years in a row. But in 2002, Diana faced a personal setback. While receiving treatment for substance abuse at a rehab center in Arizona, she was arrested for driving under the influence. She took full responsibility for her actions and served a short jail sentence near her home in Connecticut. Everyone makes mistakes, and Diana did her part to move forward. After a challenging time in 2002, Diana focused on her recovery. Two years later, in May 2004, she and her daughter, the talented actress Tracy Ellis Ross, appeared together on the cover of Essence magazine as part of the publication's 50th anniversary celebration. It was a heartwarming moment to see them side by side. Diana's career continued to flourish as well. In December 2004, she served as the main artist for a special Stevie Wonder tribute at the Billboard Music Award Century Award. This was a wonderful way to honor another music legend. Diana also participated in the Hope TV concert Tsunami Aid in January 2005, which raised money for the victims of the devastating 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake. Helping others was clearly important to Diana. Staying true to her fashion icon status, Diana debuted her very own MAC Icon makeup line in January 2005 as part of the beauty company's popular icon series. This allowed her to share her love of makeup with her fans. Later in 2005, Diana and Rod Stewart teamed up for a beautiful duet of the classic Gershwin song, I've Got a Crush on You. This collaboration was released as a promotional single and even charted, proving that Diana's musical magic hadn't faded a bit. Diana's success wasn't limited to music. In 2005, she was a special guest at Oprah Winfrey's Legends Ball Weekend, which celebrated 25 incredible African-American women in entertainment, art, and civil rights. The event was later broadcasted on ABC as a one-hour show, a powerful tribute to these amazing women. That same year, Diana collaborated with the popular boy band Westlife on a new version of her hit song, When You Tell Me That You Love Me. The song was a big hit, especially in Ireland and the UK, proving that Diana's music could still top the charts. In 2006, Diana received another honor when viewers of the TV Land Awards voted her Central Park concert special, for one and for all, as the best music moment on television. The accolades kept coming. In 2007, Diana was recognized at the prestigious Kennedy Center Honors and also received the BET Awards Lifetime Achievement Award. The following year, Diana paid tribute to the tennis legend Billie Jean King at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament's opening ceremony. She later headlined the 2008 Nobel Peace Prize concert in Oslo, Norway. In 2009, Diana took center stage at the annual Symphonica and Rosso concert series in the Netherlands. The following year, she launched her first headlining tour in three years. The More Today Than Yesterday, The Greatest Hits Tour this tour was dedicated to her friend Michael Jackson and received positive reviews across the country. Diana's achievements continued in 2011 when she was inducted into the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame. The following year, she reached another career milestone, a Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement. She also had the honor of revealing the nominees for Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards. Diana Ross's remarkable career is a testament to her talent, dedication, and enduring influence. Diana's busy schedule continued. In December 2012, she performed at the prestigious Christmas in Washington event sponsored by the White House. With former President Obama even attending the celebration, she went on two tours throughout 2013, showcasing her timeless music to fans around the world. Her dedication to her craft was further acknowledged in July 2014 when she was honored with the Ella Fitzgerald Award at the Montreal International Jazz Festival. This award recognized her significant contributions to the evolution of modern jazz singing. In 2015, Diana showed her love and support for her son Evan Ross by appearing in the music video for his song, How to Live Alone. April 2015 also marked the start of her mini residency at the Venetian in Las Vegas, entitled, the essential Diana Ross, Some Memories Never Fade. This residency gave fans an opportunity to experience Diana's greatest hits and relive cherished memories. Motown Universal didn't forget Diana either. In November 2015, they released an album titled Diana Ross Sings Songs from the Wiz. 
This album featured songs Diana recorded back in 1978 for the movie adaptation of the same name. The release of this album was a delightful trip down memory lane for Diana and her fans, revisiting her performance in the beloved film alongside Michael Jackson, Nipsey Russell, Ted Ross, Richard Pryor, and Lena Horne. Diana also restarted her In the Name of Love tour in February 2016, which she had originally launched in 2013. This tour allowed her to connect with audiences once again and share her music on a grand scale. Her incredible achievements were further recognized in November 2016, when President Obama himself awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This prestigious award is a testament to Diana's remarkable career and lasting impact on American culture. Later that same year, Billboard magazine even listed Diana Ross as the 50th most successful dance club musician of all time. Diana Ross's incredible journey shows no signs of slowing down. In 2017, she headlined the Essence Festival in New Orleans, even sharing the opening stage with her daughter, Rhonda Ross Kendrick, a real family moment. Later that year, Diana's legendary status was cemented when she received the American Music Awards Lifetime Achievement Award. She treated the audience to a medley of her greatest hits during her acceptance speech, and it was clear the crowd couldn't get enough. In a heartwarming touch, she even invited her entire family on stage for the final song, including her grandchildren, children, spouses, and even her first ex-husband, Motown Legends. Smokey Robinson and Barry Gordy joined the celebration too. Always one to embrace new ventures, Diana launched her debut fragrance, Diamond Diana, in December 2017. It was such a hit that it sold out in just a few hours. The launch coincided with a retrospective CD of her music, also titled Diamond Diana. This album did fantastically, reaching the top five on the charts. Diana didn't forget her dance fans either. A remix of her classic Ain't No Mountain High Enough topped the Billboard Dance Club Songs chart in 2017, and that wasn't her only dance music achievement. Billboard magazine even ranked her as the third most successful dance club musician of all time in December 2018. The Recording Academy honored Diana at the 2019 Grammy Awards, solidifying her legendary status. She delivered unforgettable performances of The Best Years of My Life and Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand, proving her voice remains as powerful as ever. Later that year, another remix, this time of her song, The Boss, reached number one on the Billboard Top Dance chart. In 2020, Diana kept things fresh with Supertonic Mixes, a collection of her biggest hits reimagined by remixer Eric Cooper. This release introduced her music to a whole new generation and showcased the timeless quality of her songs. Most recently, in 2022, Diana collaborated with the psychedelic pop group Tame Impala on the song Turn Up the Sunshine. This song was the lead single for the soundtrack of the hit movie, Minions The Rise of Gru. Diana's reign as a musical queen continues. In June 2022, she stole the show as the star finale act at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebration. Following that, she launched a successful UK tour and even captivated audiences with a powerhouse performance at the Glastonbury Festival. There's no stopping Diana Ross. Her dedication to her craft her ability to reinvent herself and her undeniable talent ensure her legacy will continue to inspire for generations to come. From her early days with the Supremes to her current reign as a musical icon, she has consistently pushed boundaries and inspired generations of artists and fans alike. What are you most excited to see from Diana Ross in the future? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like this video and subscribe for more content like this. Until next time.